Actually, why don't you pull up? Why don't you pull up uh, my Instagram page? It's A L underscore B A Y D H A. Okay. Bring up El Bela's page. I suspect this is going to be a small group. Um, and I actually can't see how many we've got right now because I came in as an attendee. We got we got about fifteen right now, like about one hundred and twenty people registered. But as you know, uh, like people people will start trickling in as they always do. No problem. Not a problem. But uh, let's see. Can I see? I don't think I can see the questions that are coming up. I can't see anything actually. I see you and me being in here. Okay. <laughs> well, let me. Oh, you can't see any of the questions. That's a bummer. Like, all right, I I resent the registration email to your Gmail and your Sustainable Design Masterclass. All right. In that yeah. case, let me go in and come back. Let me go out and come back in. Okay. All right, folks. Sorry for the right. delay there. Yeah, we'll get set up real quick. So he's just logging out and then logging back in. So that should shelve all your issues. So we'll be able to see your questions and we will be all good. Um, okay. Hey, there we go. Now he's in. All right. You're back. Neil's there we back. go. Sweet. All right. Cool. So, all right, we've got, I recognize a few folks in here. Um, so let me just give you a bit of background on my story. Although I suspect most people showing up to an AMA with me already know some of it. Uh, just let me ask real quick, um, how many of you don't know about the work I do in Saudi Arabia. How many of you only know me through Sustainable Design Masterclass? If any. That's the first question, because I don't want to be super repetitive, but I also don't want to leave stuff out. Actually, let's just jump into it. Just SDM, sweet. So, Let's go back to uh, 2010. I was working in a cubicle with uh, my job was to assess Arabic language media and write about current events for the U.S. State Department. Um, so I was a U.S. government contractor where um, I would, uh, I if Barack Obama gave a speech in Cairo, like he did in 2008, it was my job to take all the Egyptian media and collate it and categorize it, and then we would ship that to clients in uh, the U.S. government. And I hated that job <laughs> because I hated sitting in a cubicle and I hated not working with people. And I was really into uh, sustainability and um, especially with respect to construction and food systems, what was really a hobby of mine. I had discovered permaculture around 2005 or 2006 and was interested in getting into that professionally and didn't really have a, a clear path to do it. And at that time, I was preparing to go do an internship with Yonto Evans at the Cobb Cottage Company in Southern Oregon. For those of you who aren't familiar with Yonto, he is essentially the godfather of the American Cobb movement. Cobb being a natural building methodology using uh, clay and sand and straw uh, to construct pretty much, uh, it's essentially free form adobe. I was gonna go intern with him for a year. I was gonna move my family into the woods. I had two children at the time. Um, and instead, I was speaking with a neighbor of mine who was connected to this group in Saudi Arabia, and she said, we're looking for somebody to go and try this project out in the desert um, who will uh, be able to spend significant amounts of time out with 
tribe of Bedouin and uh, work on sustainability and economic development and housing and a bunch of other stuff. And that was in May of 2010. And over the next few months, I essentially had a, a protracted job interview where this uh, neighbor of mine and I would discuss options and discuss possibilities and, and funding and budgets and stuff like this. And in September, she said, we haven't found anybody that, that we want uh, to go out and try to lead this thing. Are you interested? And I said, yes, I am. So I quit my job. I went and took a couple courses in Cobb and Earthbag Building. I said, as part of this, I want you to get me a PDC with Jeff Lawton just to make sure I've got my bases covered, um, which they did. And then three weeks later, I was in Saudi Arabia. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about the situation in the particular area where I've been working, just south of Mecca, about 40 kilometers south, which is near the west coast of Saudi Arabia. There is an area called El Beda. And in the early 1950s, the Saudi government instituted a policy that essentially abolished the traditional land management systems as part of a nationalization of all the land within the country. They said all the land within the country now belongs to the monarchy and the traditional land management system, which was called the Himma, uh, essentially fell apart. There were over 10,000 Himma areas in the country before that happened and now there are less than 10. And what the Himma did was that they, and, and this is a very old system, it predates um, Islam, it predates Christianity, it's thousands of years old. But in this system, different amounts of land were strictly controlled, where they would say there are this many animals allowed on this spot of land during this time of year. Some were reserved for tribal leaders' horses, some were reserved for um, the poorest members of a tribe, some were strictly for beekeeping most of the year, et cetera, et cetera. And this system essentially collapsed after that policy in the 1950s, such that anybody can graze anything at any time. And that has been the case for almost 70 years now, 65 years. And so the area has undergone severe desertification. Um, even though much of it would have been considered a desert anyway, that's not to say that it wasn't productive, whereas now much of the productivity has, compl has completely collapsed. And so I came in 2010 um, with the objective of um, establishing a system that would restore ecological function to the land along with productivity and to create a new system that would allow the people to continue to graze because that's their culture and, their, and where their expertise is based. Um, and at the same time, create a more diverse economic land-based economy um, and to do it working with the people there and of course working within that climate. We average less than two inches of rain a year and our temperatures get up into the high 120s Fahrenheit for a couple months of the year um, or the high 40s in Celsius if you think in Celsius. Um, we have never hit 50, to my knowledge, in El Bela, but we do get 47, 48 regularly in uh, July and August. And so this is a tremendously challenging thing to take on, uh, socially and ecologically and economically, um, almost quixotic, I would say. And I've been there for eight years, and we've come up with a really great system on a 100 acre demo site. Um, actually, Raleigh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you guys. I'm going to see if I can show you some video here. On, uh, Let me bring it up on my page. Yeah, sure. Do you, want, do you want me to make you the presenter? Yeah, let's make me the presenter. And I will yeah. show you some of the stuff just so you get a really good picture of 
of what we're looking at. Am I the presenter yet? Uh, hold on, make, clicking OK. You are now. All right, show my screen. Uh, okay, can everybody see a grizzled looking man with a, a red thing on his head and a gray beard? Is that what everyone's seeing? See him. I can see the, this dude. Okay, so let yes. me. John says yes, face. I'm going to sh click play on this. All right. You probably didn't see very much of that, but I'm going to translate for you. This is a, a very good friend of mine named Abdurazak al Adwani, who is native to this area. He was actually born 20 feet away from where he's standing on this. And what he's saying is this wadi or this arroyo, which is, it means a, a dry riverbed, said this entire area used to be full of trees. And he names three different kinds of acacias, or I'm sorry, two different kinds, um, acacia tortillas, and one that's called uh, Salam Arabi, which I don't know the Latin is. Um, this, he said this is full of trees all the way up into the mountains that you can see. And there was a very large flood that destroyed one of the types of acacias. And he said, and the rest have all been cut down by people who came through to harvest the wood. Um, and that, that situation is applicable to much of the Arabian Peninsula. And I don't have data on how much of the peninsula has undergone this kind of desertification, but it's a lot. Um, and the reason there isn't data on this is because no one's been recording it really in the rural areas. But a lot of the old people I speak with will take me to a place where they say, this used to be green when I was a kid. There used to be running water here when I was little. And we would come here in the summer with our herds and camp here for a couple months. Um, and that, that anecdote has been repeated to me many, many times. Um, enough that I don't, I don't think that, I think there's a lot to it when you take in the history of the policy and what you would expect to happen as a result of that um, tragedy of the commons. So what we have done is we started, we, we took a site with the approval of the tribal leaders and the local magistrate to uh, take a very small watershed that includes, it includes the whole watershed. I'm gonna scroll down to, to find a map. But essentially we have mountains, we have a wadi, and we have a floodplain covering essentially 100 acres. And I worked with, uh, I started with four men who were willing to work with me that, that we paid a salary to. That team grew to a maximum of, of about 105 men in 2016. And we built lots of earthworks up in the mountains. We did lots of earthworks in the, in the wadi and in the floodplain to harvest the flash floods that would come out of these mountains when it rained. And then we experimented with about 15 species of tree that we would plant that we wanted to survive and that we wanted to produce. And then some of those trees we irrigated for five years, some for four years, some only for a year. And then two years ago, we cut the irrigation of that. And so this is a tree here that has had no irrigation since August of 2016 and only eight millimeters of rainfall since then. And that was in April of last year, April of 2017. And it is, and in this picture, you can't see the flowers because they're really small, but it's flowering um, and will produce this year, even though it's had no water for 10 months. And so what we've done is uh, we've created a viable system that will uh, function once it's established without further irrigation or fertilization, 
much as a forest or a savanna would function. And okay, here I am, I'm back. And at the same time, we have a series of trees that will function as an agroforestry and eventually will allow us to restore grazing to this site. And so we've taken a completely desertified site with less than two inches of rain a year and extreme temperatures and created a, an agricultural system that builds soil, increases biodiversity, improves water resources, and will increase the productivity of the land. Um, and that's what I've been working on for the last, since 2010, since September of 2010. And it's, uh, it's been tremendously transforming for me personally, you know, from going to working in a cubicle to being a guy leading this sort of thing and running my own webinar series now uh, on topics strictly related to uh, something that I'm very passionate about and care about a great deal. So that's that's my background on that. We've been um, we've been funded by Princess Haifa Al Faisal, who is the daughter of the late King Faisal. She was the founder and the funder of almost all of the activities we've done. And there's a lot more with the Al Bayda project that I haven't run with respect to infrastructure and education and public health that, um, that she has overseen. My part in this has been strictly with the economy and the ecology and working with the people. And that's, that's the story of El Bela in a nutshell and um, what brought me to, to where I am now. All right, so you can ask me anything about Albeda or about Sustainable Design Masterclass, or if you've got a situation you're looking for some cheap free advice on uh, over, over the webinar, I, I'm up for all of that. I'm up for all of it. All right, open the floodgates, question time. Just type in the chat box below what you'd like to ask Neil and we'll get to it. We have, I think, like two or three people coming in from Saudi Arabia, so this is definitely... Yeah, I've uh, spoken with Sabria before uh, a little bit. And uh, if I'm doing... Sabria, you can visit El Beda pretty much. Um, if you contact me via email, I can let you know when I will be there. And uh, you are free to come visit. Sure, I can have one of my men show you around, or if I'm there at the same time, I can show you around. I am not in Argentina now. I am in the Western U.S. What do you What do you mean by that, Kerry? Maybe she heard you were going to Argentina, but uh, I'd that's like to go to Argentina. Case. But I'm yeah, not. Cool spot. I don't have plans at the moment to go to. Arch I'm gonna. I'm gonna adjust this so that. There we go. And another thing we can do, since this is a way more intimate session than usually, you know, usually we have like sixty, hundred twenty people, yeah, yeah or a thousand people. Uh, we can unmute mics. So if if we want to, like, if you had a question, you want to talk one on one with Neil, we could actually have you, you know, you know, unmute your mic, and then you can just talk to Neil directly. Yep. We can do that too. So just just let us know. Type just type down below like, hey, I want to talk to Neil, and we can unmute your mic if you uh or your if you have one. So here we go. First question from Beverly. Beverly says, unmute me. Okay. All right. All right, Beverly. I'm gonna unmute you. Give me one sec. All right, Beverly. Unmuting you right now. Ask your question away. I can even, and if you want to, I could, if you have a webcam, you can turn that on too. But Beverly, uh, go ahead and talk. You're unmuted right now. Can you? Uh, let's let's test questions? the audio, Beverly. Well, let's, why don't we get to some other questions real quick? Yeah. Um, so uh, Julie asked about natural building. 
Um, I posted about earth ships. Yep, I've built a couple earth ships. I have not built straw bale yet. Um, Julie's question is, I favored straw bale in the Ozarks over earth ships, and she's wondering why. Um, one of those is because earth ships, first of all, in the Ozarks, you're dealing with really high humidity. And typically in a high humidity area, you don't need the sort of thermal mass that an earth ship will give you. Um, unless, I mean, it depends on if you're up in the mountains, but if you're in a place that doesn't get hot days, cold nights, like if you have hot days, warm nights, that earth ship isn't going to cool down on its own the way it does in some place like Taos, for instance, where Michael Reynolds live. If you've got a, a warm days, cold nights, then that diurnal swing of temperatures is what makes the earth ships function well because they've got high thermal mass. Whereas what straw bales have is high insulation, which means that you can keep a place cooler more easily rather than relying on that kind of passive solar cycle that earth ships do. Um, it, it depends on your elevation, depends, but generally in the Ozarks, I would go with high insulation rather than high thermal mass because I think you'll get a better result. On top of that, I think it's a lot easier to build straw bale, especially if you're building on your own. Easier to do a post and beam structure and fill it in with straw bale than to do an earth ship. Earth ships take so much labor. Um, it's so much labor to pack those tires and a, a straw bale house will go up quicker, um, usually easier and my impression is that it's more more uh, appropriate for the Ozark climate. All right. Um, Sherry, what did the people who worked on this project or funded it think? Do they understand what we've accomplished? Um, so there's there's different levels to this, Sherry. One level is, you know, we're trying to impress policymakers and people who make decisions on that so that we can expand. Um, we need both political and financial capital to do that. Um, the people that I've worked directly with, which are the Alfaisal family, they are gung-ho about what we are doing um, to the point that they've, uh, they're sending me to graduate school so that we can expand more easily and they continue to fund it eight years later. The, I've interacted with a number of ministries, both in the Mecca region and on the national level, who speak very positively of our project and uh, verbally will commit to assisting us, but getting that assistance to actually come through and to sign a, a public-private contract with them is, is another story. Um, I don't think most people understand the far reaching effects of what this could do if we expanded, um, but certainly what it can do locally is very well understood in terms of building a new economy, creating jobs for people who otherwise would be moving into a city, and, um, and at the same time, restoring the environment. Uh, that's very well understood and, and very well supported. Um, by a variety of people. All right. We have a question from Portugal. Hi, Joao. We have, I hope I said that right. Do we have wells, old or new, at El Bela? So we, um, there are a number of old wells, most of which are quite polluted. We dug a test well, we, we did a test bore on our site. And we went down 140 meters before we hit water, and it's it's very very salty, um, toxic to plant life. So it's not something that we can irrigate with, unless we desalinate it. So we're not using the well on our site. The water that we've irrigated with, 80% has been from a well further down the watershed that is much cleaner, and 20% was desalinated. There is a period where we were buying desal water from Mecca um, and getting it trucked down. 
that was in 2014, I believe. So yeah, there are some old wells. Almost none of, there's only one well in the region that people still drink from, and it's about an hour and a half away from, from where my site is. Um, Clint asks, have, yep, there's, there's some of my working team up in the mountains. Clint asks, have some of the locals adapted some of the principles that I applied on my trial land? There are some folks who built small terraces up in the mountains on land that they manage. But other than that, because it, it's, it's quite costly to implement this system because we have to physically we have to physically slow down the water on these floods, and that takes a tremendous amount of effort, a lot of labor. And so I think to some extent there's a feeling that um, that they can't do it on their own because it takes so many people, and they don't have the kind of uh, civic engagement that you would expect a tribe to have unless, unless you were familiar with tribal culture in Saudi Arabia. Um, and particularly in this region, because even tribe to tribe, you get very different amounts of civic engagement. Um, you're welcome, Julie. Okay, follow-up questions. Sabria, send me an email, neil at sustainabledesignmasterclass.com, and we'll, and we'll try to make it happen. Um, I think I think Beverly was ready again for. All right, to let's talk. do it. Let's try it out. All right, Beverly, take two. Gonna unmute you right now. Boom! You are unmuted. Okay. Try talking. I think huh. I think Beverly's mic is not functioning, or because yeah. she said she was speaking into it. Yeah, you might not. You might have to do something with GoTo Webinar. Like we can, we can leave leave you unmuted, and uh, you know, if you figure it out, we'll hear you. Yeah, <laughs> and then let's go that way. But sorry, these tech these tech things sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, oh, but she. I'll go for What's it. That? I was like, oh, question from Neil Bertrando. Yeah. Everyone. All right, he's asking, what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned from your mistakes and failures? Man, good question, okay. Neil. <laughs> um, so one thing, the issue of land ownership where I work is really tricky because you have traditional boundaries that the people still operate on. Like they will buy and sell land between themselves in a way that isn't recognized officially by the government. And because according to the national government, all of the land is government land. But according to the people, um, everything also belongs to one family or another. And so it's it's a tremendous, the, the issue of land ownership is gonna be tricky wherever you are. Um, in our case, it's particularly tricky. And I was trying to, I was trying to uh, move on to a different site that would allow us to grow more quickly and to hire more people. And I had tacit approval from the magistrate. And if I had approval from the families that lived there, uh, then we would have been able to do it. We would have been operating in legally gray area, but uh, it would have been okay. And so I wanted to meet with these families and I didn't, and which I did, I met with the families that uh, grazed their animals on this land, but I didn't prepare the communications for that sort of engagement. And that meeting was an absolute flop. Like they, they didn't want to listen to me. They didn't, they weren't interested in having us do anything there um, because I had relationships with some of their family members, but not with the elders of those families who would be making the decision uh, if they wanted us to go work there. And eventually, and what that ended up doing was it, it made us have to go the official route to get access to that land, which is still happening. 
four years later, we're still crossing the T's and dotting the I's on that. And so even though I had good relationships with the bulk of the people there, I didn't prepare the sort of communications. I didn't prepare those people for that ask or for that pitch. And because of that, the pitch failed completely. And that was a, uh, that was a, that was a big failure for me. I, I thought my relations were better than they were. I thought our reputation would, would be enough and, and it wasn't. Um, that was a bit, that was a big failure. Mm, some other mistakes we've made are more along the technical lines of things where the first three months of dam building we did, we, we didn't size them properly. We underestimated the strength of the flood that we would get. And so we had probably 10 check dams wash out in our first rainfall. Um, and so the, we lost about three months of work when it, when it first rained, which was in January of 2011. That, yeah, that's a video of a small flood in our mountains. That's one of my workers. His name is Hajaj. He, he's a wonderful person. Um, these floods in the desert can get really strong, and we were a little bit loosey-goosey with our numbers. Um, and there's a, there's a lot more I can talk about on that, but I think I'm really interested in Beverly's situation here. Beverly's in Senegal. Let me, let me know if I hear this right, Beverly. You're working in Senegal with the same issues of desertification and animals free grazing all over the place. And you, um, you're trying to get, yeah. Beverly, let us know specifically, Let's give me a specific question that you want me to answer because it sounds like a really interesting situation. Yeah, at the bottom she says, we think we can get land from the village chief and 23 women who want to FSMR it, but water is an issue. So if you just type a little follow-up question, that'd be great. Uh, man, that, that <laughs> webinar we did with Tony Renato is. Do you mean FMNR, Beverly? I think that's what she means. Yeah, I think you mean Tony Renato's stuff. Yeah, they want to farm it. Uh, clarify for me if you mean FMNR, the Farmer Managed Natural Regeneration. Um, we had a question about if I have considered using Alan Savory's system of restoration, herding many cattle onto dead areas and then the dung restores grass, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Faye, Alan and I have, uh, we've gotten in a few arguments on Facebook, which are, I think are no longer publicly available because they were on a page that is now defunct. But um, Alan's got some really crucial insights about working in deserts. But where I am, if like, if you were to bring in, you know, a few hundred head of cattle onto a piece of land and then move them in a few days, right? you would definitely get that dung and, and urine cake. Um, the problem is because of the geography of our place and because we have gone as long as 36 months with no rainfall, it's likely that all of that dung and urine and stuff would just dry up and blow away. Um, the hoof action that Alan talks about doesn't apply when you're working with camels or when you're working in sand dunes um, or when you're working in very rocky desert because either it's sand dunes and the wind's just going to cover up those hoof prints or it's super rocky and they're not making an indentation anyway and so that that dynamic doesn't happen where i am and then the other problem is because rain is so um, inerrant because it's so irregular you can't rely on it to uh, supplement that sort of organic pulse that you'd get with those animals coming in that being said uh, 
animals are a crucial part of the mineral cycle where we are. You know, the, the stomach of a camel or the stomach of a goat or the stomach of a sheep is the only moist, bacteria-rich environment we have. And so definitely once our trees are established um, and they provide windbreak and they provide shade and they provide a little bit of condensation in the winter months, um, the microclimate that they create will allow us to bring animals back to the land and graze it and increase that, uh, that soil building cycle. But if we were to just do animals without any of the water management or tree planting, it's likely the animals would die and the dung and urine would dry up and blow away. And um, that's, uh, that's my take on that. Now, I think once, if you're averaging around 200 millimeters of rain a year, if you're getting two um, rainfalls a year, like a summer rain and a winter rain, it's likely that cattle is going to be, cattle or, or some other grazing animal is going to be a, an excellent tool to use almost at the beginning. Um, but once you're in a hyper arid condition, it's it's likely to fail based on, you know, based on other geographic factors. All right. That was a little long. Uh, okay. Beverly is saying, just organic farming would like to do tree planting too. Um, Beverly, my question for you is, where is your water coming from? Is it from a well? Or, um, and what's your average? There, there's, there's too many factors to really be able to answer you well there. Um, and if Costa Rica is similar to the climate you've got, then, then that doesn't match my perception of Senegal, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, what's the history of wildfire in my region in El Beda? It, it Historically, it doesn't happen. There, there's, no, uh, there's no history of using burning in the area of the country where I am or of burning happening regularly because, because it's still a desert. And so the grasses are almost entirely annuals where they're opportunistic. When it rains, the, you'll have this pulse of grasses that show up for a number of months, and then we'll go to seed and die off and wait for the next pulse of rain to come. Um, but the, the perennials that we have are almost all shrubs and trees, very few perennial grasses where we are. And so the, the fire is, this isn't a fire ecology. Hmm. Dwayne says, how are we building our system from the top of the watershed? Let me, uh, starting at the top of the watershed, we're doing very simple earthworks because we do have some very steep places. There are some photos in there, Raleigh, if you scroll way down of the top of the watershed. But um, small stone berms, right? We have a lot of stone. The mountains we're in are mostly granite and basaltic. And so we have done, uh, similar to what you're seeing in that picture, those are check dams. So that's a little further down where you get more water hitting that spot. But um, we'll do small stone buns or berms that are between 15 to 50 centimeters high. And what they do, we did most of those on contour where they're keyed into bedrock on both sides. So they're not going to get side cut. Um, and then it's shaped a bit like a banana. So they're not going to get uh, undercut. It, it controls where the flow of the water goes. And then what those do is they build up silt, much like a check dam. And then that creates areas for us to plant up in the mountain. So in general, Duane, the, the strategy we have is to physically slow the water down first with, um, with these earthworks almost all of which are stone. All, all the ones up in the mountain are stone. They're built up. Um, and then those physical structures create a place where we can put the biology back in. And then after that, it's managing the water biologically. 
rather than through these physical structures. Um, what am I missing here, Raleigh? Am I missing any questions here? Yeah, there's there's a bunch. I mean, if you go down, uh, like there's Faye right after Dwayne. Dwayne has another question. Like, look down after Beverly, and there's probably like six or seven more. Uh, like, here's another one from Dwayne. Uh, how are you building your system from the – oh, he already said that. Yeah, we just got that one. Um, we got history of wildfire. We've got Niels. What are the best leverage points that I see for developing regenerative local food systems and supply chains? Neil, do you mean in Saudi Arabia or do you mean in general? Um, did we have funds to pay the wages for the hundred men who did the work for your project? Yes, we paid them, Carrie. Um, on average, we paid them about $800 a month, which was uh, about twice the rate of twice the regular rate of labor. Um, Saudi Arabia's labor situation is really quite um, problematic. I don't like the word problematic, but I'm going to use it here. Uh, where you have a lot of immigrants there to do manual labor from Afghanistan or Pakistan or Sudan or Yemen or Bangladesh or India. And these guys will typically get paid about a thousand riyals a month, maybe 1500 riyals a month if they're untrained. And we were paying these Saudi men about 3000 riyals a month as a, as a start. And that was all funded by the Al Faisal family who were the founders of our project. Um, okay, Neil in general. So this is a really, this is a really crucial question because when you're talking about, um, and Neil, you already know this, but when you're talking about rural areas, you've got the problems of decreasing population density, right? Where machinery is taking the place of labor and automation is taking the place of people. And so you have fewer and fewer people and therefore fewer and fewer services um less for the kids to do so the kids are growing up and leaving the farm by and large um whereas if you're close to a city you know if you're farming in a in you know within 100 miles of a big city then you've got the market for it but there's the challenge of transitioning right so if you and if you're uh if you're 100 miles outside of chicago You've definitely got a market for what you could call uh, regenerative food, right? If you got the marketing straight, but the transition to that is so tough, right? Because you have, I mean, if, you, if you're if you taking a soy field and converting it into an agroforestry or a silvopasture, that could take you 15 years, right? Maybe you want to do an acorn-fed pig operation. Um, well, you got you got to plant the oak trees. <laughs> And so the, it's not that I see a good leverage point. What I'm seeing are these choke points and these bottlenecks. And so the, um, there's a main leverage point in facilitating that transition. There's another leverage point in the finance of it. There's got to be a way to finance farmers to do this without, you know, skimming, skimming their profits or without denying them the profits of the work that they're going to be doing. Um, and then for supply chain, I, th I think, so here, here's the short answer, Neil. I think marketing. I think marketing is where we're failing. I think we can produce it. Um, but marketing it is uh, something that we don't do very well. Joao, all of my workers were Saudi. Yes. I had one Yemeni guy who had been living there for 30 years. But uh, essentially, yes, all Saudi. I had two Filipino men help me in teaching uh, the building of this house in that picture you see in the middle. That, yep, that one right there. So this is this was our headquarters that we built. It took us a year 
We had 30 Saudi men with no previous construction experience who built this. And me and one other American and two Filipino guys supervised that. Um, Beverly, what else did we do besides berms, plant and irrigate trees? We did um, tech dams, Zuni bowls, uh, Zai holes, swales. Um, we did some composting that went along with the tree planting. Um, the irrigation we did was drip irrigation. We experimented with some air wells. Uh, we built a pigeon house uh, to be able to collect pigeon manure. We built a bat house so that we could collect bat manure. Uh, the bat house was the first earth ship that I built. Mm -hmm. And uh, essentially what we were trying to do was get the biology there that would start increasing soil organic material to start creating soil. So one of the things that I noticed when I was first there was that we, we had a lot of flies and lizards and snakes and not much of anything else. I wanted to get termites on the site, right? Because termites are the, are the earthworms of the desert. They are one of the only animals in the desert that will take woody material and biodegrade it and convert it back into soil. And the great thing about termites is they go underground to do it. So all of the lignins in that wood, all of the organic, the carbon in that wood gets brought underground by the termites and then the termites decompose it, right? So on, on a very small level, termites are building soil. It's just, and it's getting to flip that, that cycle from desertification to recreating soil, increasing soil matter, getting plant life in and making it easier for more plants to fill in the niches where they can, right? Um, ants also will do this. Um, ants will farm fungus in their uh, nests to be fed to the queen ant, right? So that so it's really trying to get a mycelia layer in there, getting soil bacteria back in there. But all of it starts with getting the water in the ground and getting it to stay there rather than getting rather than having it wash away. Uh, Dwayne, have we looked at asks, have we looked at mass plantings on the coast? in an attempt to get the biotic pump working to send more moisture inland. Yeah, it, I don't use that terminology in the materials that we've presented to uh, the, the Mecca governorate, but it is one of the things that we look at where we have the pattern of our watershed is duplicated geographically across the whole region. And so there is the possibility of using floods that run into the Red Sea to reforest that area and get the small water cycle starting. And I've talked about that in a number of our webinars, I believe. Oh, here we go. Okay, Sherry asks, when I started in 2010, did I have an expectation on what would happen to the land trees by 2018? What did I expect this to be like in 10 years or 50 years? So Sherry, I'll admit that when I went in, it was more like a, let's see if we can pull it off. I did not have any expectations at all. You know, we didn't know if we'd be able to get the people to work. We didn't know if we'd have access to this kind of land. We believed we would, but we didn't know. Um, we didn't know if anything would grow here. We didn't know if it would rain in the first four years. And so it was, when I came in, I didn't have many expectations. It was more like a, let's see if this is doable. Let's see if we can pull it off. And so um, I, think, I think not having expectations of where it would go was very helpful actually. Um, but in 50 years, I expect it to be a functioning agroforestry. 
Um, and I'm hopeful that it will spread across hundreds of thousands of acres. Neil asks, have we sold or trialed any products from the site? We have sold honey from our site. It is a mesquite, it is a mesquite and a, an acacia honey that we've sold. We have sold uh, hibiscus flowers from our site. We, um, and we will be hopefully selling Moringa oil within two years. Yeah, this honey so, so, this honey sold for $100 a kilo, about $50 a pound. We didn't sell very much of it, but we didn't produce very much of it either. Um, Sharon, yes, we got the termites and the ants. Termites showed up in 2015 and the ants came in 2016 is the first time I noticed them. We've also had a dramatic increase in the number of birds and bird nests on site. We had pigeons show up and uh, squat in our pigeon house. We had zero pigeons. We didn't buy any pigeons. We haven't fed them or watered them. And we now have about 20 living in our pigeon house. Um, we do have bats on site. We have seen an uptick in the number of beetles, um, grasshoppers, crickets, uh, lizards, and snakes. So biodiversity is definitely increasing. We've also seen the, the number of mushrooms grow up, or go up, rather. Um, our first rainfall, we found one species of mushroom in two of our swales. The last time it rained, that I was able to observe it, which was in 2015, we had five species of mushroom. So we've got good indications from, from nature. Um, yeah, so Beverly says rodents eat our compost piles and we haven't figured a way to contain it without that problem yet. And disease to humans from mosquitoes, yeah, you've got malaria. Uh, let me chew on that for a bit, Beverly, because I'm wondering if you, well, do you have cats that like to eat rodents? Uh, that's one thing that we have. We don't have a rodent problem where we are, but we do have lots of cats. And I had to build our pigeon house such that cats would not be able to get in. Mm. And the disease to humans from mosquitoes, yeah, solving malaria is above my pay grade. <laughs> it's a huge issue. How early in the project did we gain support of the queen and how did we do that? So there, there isn't a queen in Saudi Arabia. This, this project was founded by, um, the youngest daughter of the late King Faisal. Um, this was her idea. And she was looking for somebody who would inform it and lead it. And I got hired on to, I got hired by her through an, through an intermediary. Um, so it, it's more like she gained my support and I joined her project. Hmm. So Sherry says, how did the termites and ants get there if you didn't bring them in? That is a great question. Um, but I have found that if you are creating enough food for something, it will show up. I don't know where they come from, but they show up and they stick around. Ants um, are somewhere. Yeah, they're, they're coming from somewhere. But uh, Beverly asked more about some of our structures. This picture is a, go back to that picture, Raleigh. So these are some of the small stone berms that we've done up in the mountain, Beverly. These are only 15, 20 centimeters tall. Um, they're made from rubble that we raked into contour that we established with a, a water level, right? A bunyip level. And this is what it looks like when it, has only had a third of an inch of rainfall in two years. 
but um, <clears throat> when it rains, we get a bunch of seed deposition along these berms, and then grasses will grow along that berm. Excuse me. Mm. Neil says, how can people best support us in our efforts in regenerating landscapes and communities? I kind of want to ask you that question, Neil. Uh, but let me, let me, I think it's cliche to say, but I think voting with our dollars when we can is still the best thing to do. Unless you are a, already a producer, unless you already have land and you are farming it, if you're a consumer, the best way to support this is be picky about where your food comes from. Know your farmer. Know where your food comes from and support the people who are already trying to do this. Because more often than not, it's, it's the finances that are holding people back on this. Um, now, if you're a producer, it's another thing, right? Or if you're someone like me that's building these systems, you know, in a place like Senegal or Saudi Arabia or, or where, where have you, um, then it's, I think there's a lot of support online. There's a good community of us, of people who are trying to build these sorts of things. And we support each other, which you're a part of, you um, Carrie, that Carrie supports my point. She says, we notice every time we plant, Carrie, I don't know if you're a man or a woman, actually. You say, we notice that every time we plant new kinds of fruit trees on our land, we have new species of birds that show up to live there. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing thing. But if, you're, if you produce enough food for a particular thing, it shows up. Um, yeah. Sherry's asking about graduate school again for you. Oh, okay. So, <clears throat> so I see one of the major choke points on this is in the enterprise creation, right? This, the project I've been on has been privately funded by people who have an interest in the result, but that's also very unique to have people with both the interest and the money and the access to land to be able to do that. Um, that, that's if you don't have any of those you don't have a foot in the door anyway and i wrote an article a few years back on a defunct blog called two visions permaculture where i talked about how if before we can have regenerative agricultures we need to have the market for them and so a lot of what i think the right way to approach this is to create products that use sustainably grown products in their product stream and to create the market for those products first and then vertically integrate backward where those companies which are creating those products all of a sudden are investing in the land and making sure that those products are being grown or the raw materials for those are being grown appropriately and ecologically, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm going to graduate school to study entrepreneurship with the aim of creating enterprises in Saudi Arabia with this project that will uh, give us the financial base to expand this system, right? And so the things that we can produce in El Beda are quite numerous, right? We have our tree crops, which I believe will mostly be based on acacias, zizifus, moringa, potentially mesquite. But off of those, we can get hair care products, skin care products, animal feed, medicinal compounds, uh, not fiber, not from the trees at least. Um, you, so you look at zizifus, for instance, which is a, a jujube in English. It's one of the main components in traditional Chinese medicine. And there's massive demand for zizifus leaf powder or dried and ground zizifus seed, which we can produce without irrigating in El Beda, right? So that's, that's a potential product stream where if we can 
process what we're creating and sell it to a Chinese market, whether in the Middle East or in China itself, then that's a viable business that we can use to acquire more land, to restore more land to productivity. Um, then you have Moringa oil or ground Moringa leaf, which we did a webinar with Aaron Elton a while back, who, who's doing Moringa in East Africa. A number of product streams we can create off of that, that we can sell. And then you have all the grazing. Um, from Based off of the grazing, we can do dairy, we can do leather, we can do wool, um, we can do goat hair textiles, where we work with local women who will weave the local goat hair, and then there's a story on that, and we can set. So the, the bottleneck for us is on the enterprise creation. So I'm going to go study entrepreneurship so we can build these businesses in Albela and uh, use that as our financial base for expansion. That's what we're going to go do. Uh, and I feel the need to do that because the pitfalls are numerous, and I don't we, – we actually hired a CEO a couple years ago. This is another one of those failures. Um, we hired a CEO a couple years ago to get us started down this path. And he didn't really believe in what we were doing um, and came up with stuff completely different. And, and it didn't work. And we let him go a while ago. Um, but so I'm going to go study it. I'm going to go study it. Uh, here we are. Faye says, Drainage and flood areas. I've had great success in digging ditches and then filling in with stones to create a small weir or a wall. Having a digger would be very helpful. I also use underground Nova pipes to direct the water. Yeah, that's a, that's, it's a good management system. Um, anytime you're in the desert, and particularly the desert with mountains, you're dealing with floods. And the right tools are going to depend entirely on the geography of where you are. That's where they are. Hetty asks about if we're looking at, at cactuses or other succulents. Not really. Um, Opuntia is considered an invasive species where we are. Um, and it's, it's grown higher up in the mountains where we are. It's, it's actually, if you can believe it, it's too hot where we are for the Opuntia to get established. <laughs> um, Opuntia being the uh, prickly pear. Uh, they grow at about a, a 1, 1,500 feet higher in elevation from where we are in a city called Taif. Mm. Sherry says, what's happening on the demo site now? So we're still using this site. There's still a number of experiments and construction projects we're doing there, but the bulk of the work is done. Um, we are going to plant a few thousand more moringa and a few probably a couple thousand more zizifus as well and um, that site is considered the headquarters of the project but it's not where we are going to be it's not big enough for us to produce enough to create businesses that will sustain the people so yeah we're still using it uh, still very much working there we don't have 100 men working anymore, um, in part because we're in a political bottleneck. But, uh, yep, very, very active still. And there we go. Question from Julie, though, right, just came in. Yeah. It's like, um, he's like she says, Regarding their entrepreneurship endeavor, I'm trying to get a sense of scale. Did I understand you're working on 130 acres, or are you expanding? No, we've got a uh, – the Mecca Governorate has designated a 5,000-acre spot for us to manage, and we are in the process of finishing the politics of that site. And we estimate that we'll be able to plant between seven and 800,000 trees there. And eventually you have a decent, you know, a few thousand honeybee hives there and potentially a few thousand uh, sheep and goats or camels as well grazing that site. 
Um, and then there is a 250,000 acre site that someone has asked us to go work on after we're done in Obeda in a different region of the country. Actually, I have a question about how did you get the team, your team effectively working together? Like, how did that, like, <laughs> the process so that they could effectively work on building these structures, building the houses, planting the trees? It was, it was, um, well, we started quite small. Started with a team of four men that grew to about 30 men over the first six months. And then we worked together for a year or two, just the 30, 35 of us, where I was with them every day. I was actually living in El Beda at that time. I had a room where I slept at the governor, at the magistrate's office. And so I was there from 5 a.m. I was, I was there permanently, except for the weekends, for a couple of years. And of course, except for holidays, et cetera. But um, the, it was the daily interaction, the trust that we gained in each other, and then the experience that they had over those first two years. And then we expanded to a larger team. I selected eight men and eight deputies to lead those different teams who had been working with me for two to three years. Who, And, and then I ran some classes with them on placement and designing of these structures. But it was it was just uh, it was just the experience of building the demo site together. Um, and then over time we came to trust each other. Over time we we saw the feedback that we got when it rained and the and the effects that happened in the places where we'd done it right. And then things got better, both, both our technique in placement and in constructing and in managing, all of that improved over the first few years because it was somewhat experimental for all of us when we first got started, right? I mean, I had, I had book knowledge on a lot of this, but not a lot of experience. But uh, we got enough feedback in those first few months from that first rain that, that we knew what we were doing after that. Um, well, that. Okay, so that, from Sherry. Sherry, Sherry asked about the 5,000 acre site. It's just down the road, Sherry. It's a five minute drive from our demo site. It's exactly the same climate. Just down the road. Thanks for coming, Neil. We'll talk to you later. Um, Beverly says, what are the curved frame structures with mud? No, those, those are earthships. Those curved frame structures are, uh, yeah, that's an earthship. So it's, um, the foundation is the pack tires that you can see. The bird cage is rebar, and then that's a concrete, concrete over lattice work. And then we buried that under about a meter of one to two meters of sand, and it's keyed into the mountainside. And that's our bat house right there. That'll hold a couple thousand bats. All right. Anything else? We're coming. We're we're coming up on an hour and fifteen minutes. Yeah. Last last chance to do any questions. Thanks. Thanks for popping in. This is the last minute webinar, but it was definitely a good. Yeah. Good experiment. Um. Oh, Neil. I got I got a last question. How how does oof the lessons from this project? How do you see it applying to California? You know, California's got more political issues than anything else. I think the when you're in a republic or a democracy, it's much harder to get things to change than when you're in a monarchy. Um, I think there's a tremendous number of people in California doing amazing work along the along very similar lines. Uh, but I think there's a 
you, you have to have a cultural shift in a place like California. And, you know, there's a number of organizations there that I have a lot of respect for. Ecologically, it's very similar, right? You have the Sierra Nevadas on your east. Well, think about Southern California. You've got your Sierra Nevadas on the east and the ocean on your west. And you're in that neck of land between the mountains and the, and the coast. I don't know that it's a closed loop water cycle the way uh, the west coast of Saudi Arabia is. But, I mean, creating regenerative agricultures is really, it, it, it has to happen all over the place. It has to happen because the ecological effects of standard agriculture are, are devastating. And in that sense, and, and you're seeing that in California with, uh, with the drought that happened, was it last year or two years ago? Well, that uh, was mostly two years ago. Yeah, um, but you're also seeing it with the fact that we're, we've drained the Colorado River entirely and, um, and aquifer depletion is, is the last line of defense on water in California. And once, once that's gone, it's gone. And then you're just going to have cheap desertified land. All right. So I, I, see, I see Saudi Arabia as a microcosm of everywhere else. I mean, we're in a natural desert, but everywhere else is also being desertified very slowly in some places and quite quickly in others. Um, so, but I, I, I perceive that the, the main obstacles in California are political and cultural. The, the, the money to yeah. do it in California is in California. The knowledge of how to do it is there. The organizations that would do it are also there. But uh, there's there's a cultural and a political obstacle. Oh yeah, that is a true statement. Okay, <laughs> well, sounds like we got two more potential questions from Patricia and uh, Joa. You can answer those, but I think those will that'll probably be our cutoff time. We'll close it up after that. All right, sounds good. All right, so where's where's Patricia? How have the people there perceived this project? Has this created an interest to duplicate? So the, fa the people that we employed relied on our project for their income. And they saw, of course, they saw that as this uh, very beneficial thing. And the perceived changes to the land and the water, that's more... It's not something that you really perceive, right? It's rained six times in the last eight years. And so they've seen the effects naturally on the site, but we haven't gotten to the point where we're producing a lot, um, in part because this has just been the pilot project. And so I think people are hopeful. The ones that understand what we're doing are hopeful. The ones that don't understand what we're doing are very tolerant because they see that we've put their cousins or their uncles or their nephews to work. Um, and so they're, they're, and even the fact that they have a white American non-Muslim guy, I think by and large people are okay with that. It's not going to be until we have a functioning business that's bringing, putting money in people's pockets that we're going to have widespread acceptance of what we're doing. Because that, that's what people perceive as, as the need. <laughs> Um, and I don't, I don't know that we could have hoped for anything better than that, to be honest. Uh, Carrie asked about the beehives. Those are traditional Yemeni hives. They're horizontal constructed log hives uh, made from acacia or mango wood. And then, was there a question I missed, Raleigh? Uh, Jaw asked a tree planting question. Like, what have. was the? So we pretty standard practice, Joao. The yeah. um, the stuff we got from the nursery, we uh, we trimmed the roots. We got the standard black 
bag nursery stock, trim the roots, dug the hole, put in some compost, put in a liter of water and buried it. Um, but the most successful ones that we have planted, we actually planted from seed. The Moringa that we planted, we planted from seed. We got a 90% germination rate. And the uh, Zizifus that we planted from seed has also done very, very well. And the other folks that I know that work in desert have also been advocates for planting trees from seed, quite, which has been a surprise to me. But uh, that's how it is. That's how it is. That's how uh, it no, is. Carry those hives do not have removable frames. Um, I, if you go to that Instagram page, you can see video of one of my guys harvesting honey. All right, what do you reckon, Neil? Is that looks like we had yeah, a pretty good session so far, just over an hour? I think we're good, and uh, yeah, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming on. I, I enjoyed this and wanted to see where people were at with this. So thanks to the 25 of you that showed up. Um, and unless there's anything else, we're going to call it good. Next week, let me let me put in a plug for this. Next week, we have Patrick Worms coming on. Um, Raleigh, I just sent you an email okay. with him. But Patrick is the senior policy and science advisor to the World Agroforestry Program at the UN. Um, nice. and he, he agreed to come on next week and he's, he's already got his presentation ready and, uh, he does a lot of advocacy, but also a lot of practicing in West Africa and in Europe. So I'll be interested to hear what he's got to say. Hope you guys can make it or see the, uh, the replay, but Patrick's really smart. He sees a lot from his position, and uh, I'm excited to have him on. Oh, that would be cool, a UN guy. So, Yeah. All right, fantastic. Well, thanks, everybody. I'm going to cut that recording. Boop, it's cut. And, yeah, have an awesome day. And if you don't know already, go to sustainabledesignmasterclass.com. We got, we got 52 webinars now. It's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Yeah. That is pretty All cool. Right. All right, Raleigh, thanks for doing this on short notice. You got it. All right. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Peace, everybody. Bye, everybody.